you very much. Um, yeah, so obviously we've heard various different examples of how AI is being used, some thoughts about how it could be used. And in my role as a product manager, um, one of the things that is very keen and close to my heart is to make sure that when we do something, we do it for the right reasons and with a clear goal in mind. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'd just like to take you through some examples where we've seen you know, benefits of AI and some examples of that. Also, <clears throat> some pitfalls. And then think about how humans can get involved in that process to make sure that we get the outcomes that we want when we do implement something of this nature. So there's a quote that I read in a Medium article, which is probably quite true, that there are lots of different places where artificial intelligence can help. It can change the publishing industry by automating, automating repetitive tasks, lowering costs, and making things run more smoothly. But we need to make sure what we're trying to reduce, how we're trying to reduce it, and be able to monitor that at all times to make sure. The next slide is a little bit flippant, but I just thought I would put it in there because in the next little while, I'm just going to talk about some of the, the pitfalls that have been seen, not necessarily in the publishing space, but in other areas where AI has been implemented. It's not quite this bad yet, um, obviously, but everyone knows the example of Terminator and trying to take over the world. But these next few examples will just give you some ideas of things that have gone potentially not as planned when AI has been implemented in certain industries. So the first one, and some of these are a little bit old, so I'll, I will say that they have been adapted, but in first cases, this is what happened. So Amazon's AI-enabled recruitment tool only recommended men to start with. This was basically because the data set that it was trained on took 10 years of resumes and CVs from Amazon applicants, but the vast, vast majority of those people that applied were male. So it didn't have a data set which was good enough to really understand that a female candidate could be the right person for the job. AI pulled this, and it has been adapted. I treat a group. They had an, I, an AI application screener which rejected applicants due to age. Um, this was settled in a lawsuit uh, in the US. Um, basically, the hard cutoff for applicant screening was that females over 55 and males over 60 were automatically rejected, again, based upon incorrect information put into the model that was first applied. Chat GPT hallucinates court cases. This is the example of a lawyer called Stephen Schwartz in the US who was, who was prosecuting um, a Mexican airline on behalf of a client who got hit by a metal trolley coming down the aisle during service when the plane hit turbulence. During his investigation into precedent and other cases of this nature, he used ChatGPT to help find him. It made up six cases, which he subsequently did not check and used in his presentation in the court. He was fined around half a million dollars, I think it was, by the court for using um, incorrect information in his statements. Data set, this is the T tweets um, thing that was brought out by Microsoft, and basically it was a, uh, a chatbot for Twitter, which would then start to have conversations. It fell foul of something known as Godwin's Law, which is the example where the longer you let a conversation go, particularly online, that the more likely you are to get something which brings out a racist comment or an allusion to Adolf Hitler. Um, it also probably didn't help that people were particularly trying to get it to do this. Um, again, this is, a, this is quite old. I think this was 2016 when this came out, so obviously things have moved on since then. But again, an unintended consequence of something that was ostensibly meant to be quite an interesting um, exercise. And the final one on this slide is really about AI algorithms identifying everything but COVID-19. Now, this was something that was used based upon the data set that was trained on. All of the patients were scanned when they were lying horizontal. Um, and then the inference from the model for that was that any patient who was then being scanned upright was not ill enough, so therefore it couldn't possibly have been COVID-19. Again, you know, just about making sure that the data is fit for purpose when it is used, particularly for this kind of purpose. And then the final one, which scared me a little bit, and it's not necessarily related directly to a computer which is just on a desktop. This is very much a real-life robotic incident. 2022, a chess robot brought the finger of a seven-year-old opponent. 
This was all because the robot itself had parameters in when and what would, expect to be ha what would be expected to happen when they played a move for the opponent to then play the move. The child played their move too quickly. The robot grabbed his finger and broke it. So, yeah, there's some pitfalls there. But of course, that is not you know, what we're talking about. These are not publishing-related industry issues. Um, and there also, of course, are some very, very good examples of how AI and humans are doing great things now and will continue to do in the future. So there are examples of robotic beehives using AI to save the bees in global food supply by understanding trends in bee behavior, also trying to get past the um, colony collapse syndrome. This is what they're focusing on very much to address. The role of artificial intelligence in wildlife conservation. So this is looking at large migrations, large movements of wildlife in Africa and trying to predict trends about where these areas will go, but also trying to predict the trends and also understand the behavior and movements of poachers to be able to put in, in, in place mitigations to address this kind of issue, particularly around rhinos, <coughs> sorry, in, in Africa. Um, an artificial intelligence tool can accurately identify cancer. So this was uh, a study which was done which actually sees that now 87% uh, through scans, there's a tool which can look at particular nodules within the lungs, particularly for lung cancer, and identify whether they think that that is going to turn malignant at some point in the future, obviously all continuing to be worked on. And there's the general sense that AI is essential for solving the climate crisis by looking at trends and weather patterns, looking at where things are going wrong, what, what's happening, predicting the future, but also trying to help, again, put in mitigations for areas where we know there are, where we know, not we, where we, there is the thought that there is going to be problems in the future. Now, obviously, we've been talking about AI and its proliferation more widely, particularly due to ChatGPT, ChatGPT, the more recent versions. Uh, I just wanted to share a slide about the adoption or usage of certain tools and technologies over the course of the last 20 to 30 years and how quickly things became um, kind of well out there in the marketplace and people were aware of. And this is really just to kind of look at the sense that I'm sure we've all had it in our day-to-day -day jobs where somebody has come to us and said, I found this idea, I found this AI tool which I think could help us in a particular way. Now, we really need to do it, but also there's this, the flip side of it where people are worried about things like ChatGPT GPT, and other large language models taking away people's jobs. So, in terms of using, having a million users, ChatGPT in 2022 got a million users within five days. And if you look at some of the other things on there, yes, they're older. Um, Netflix, for example, back in 1999, but a lot longer, with the exception of threads, um, to actually reach that 1 million users. That's just a, a bit of a setup. Um, so the next I just want to talk about generative AI particularly and how there are elements here which can boost productivity. So the first example is an example in customer service where there was a 14% productivity increase in new hires and hires that were not potentially performing as well as was expected. There is a tool which was used to really understand the behaviors and trends of high-performing individuals and then provide coaching materials and ideas for the lower-performing and newer staff to try and use those to, to boost their productivity. Generative AI improving content quality and variety. So here you've got examples of personalization. Um, being able to take information from different sources and create new and potentially interesting uh, outputs. Also around language and being able to translate from the native language that it was written in into another language. And the final one is really around looking at um, productivity increases in uh, software development, where again, looking at good code, the way that it, when, it's, when it's well written and performs well, being able to provide tips along with um, the work or for the work of software developers as they were coding. There is obviously a lot of potential for AI when used in the right way. So one of the things you could say is that anything that is repetitive and predictable could really be scaled and use, use AI to, to, to reduce human input potentially, but also make those things more productive. So some ex examples that have been talked about in this afternoon sessions, but, but other times as well, are things there like data availability statements, ethics declarations, author services to help the evaluation process. So for example, the idea of taking an abstract, putting it into a tool which then would suggest which journal of a particular corpus might be the most appropriate for an author to submit to. 
plus the creative tasks that we've talked about in a couple of other spaces, so supporting marketing programs, helping marketing staff to make social media posts and blogs in a quicker way than they would do if they had to write them all manually, summarizing content. There's a very good example done when I was working at Springer Nature, which was an AI-written book around um, the technology of lithium-ion batteries, which took all of the corpus of the books that were in the Springer Nature um, field on lithium-ion batteries, and it actually wrote a book. Um, and it was then made freely available as an ebook on the uh, Springer Books site. And also personalizing content, you know, using trends of people, you know, uh, what people are using, um, making it written in a way which is more appropriate for a given audience or a given person based upon what they've interacted with in the past. But also, I mentioned again around translating things from a, um, a language into another language just to give a sense and make it more easy for non native speakers to access that content. One thing I would say is that I've heard it, and I'm sure many of you have heard it as well. It is very tempting to look for uses for AI. It is an exciting space. There's a lot of things out there. It's becoming more and more um, widespread now, particularly with chat G GPT. And we have people who come and ask us, oh, we found this technology again. Can we find a reason to use it? And really kind of potentially falling into that um, space of looking at something to fit, a, uh, finding a problem for these two te technology to fit rather than doing it the other way around. But on the flip side of that coin, there are also potential pitfalls. So we've already talked about incorrect determinations. Take the example of COVID-19 previously based upon biased or incomplete data or a data set which is not correct. Copyright issues. There is potential for outputs to be made which are using copyrighted material when it shouldn't be and the user might not be aware of this. A lot of these things may need human intervention. I think there is potentially a sense, um, some may disagree, that using AI can make everything quicker. But I would argue that to make sure you're getting outputs which are valid and correct, are actually going to take quite a bit of time because you may need to use humans to validate, feed that data back into a model and make sure that it is giving the outputs that are expected. Take the example of when you were, you know, if you're looking on Google search and the algorithm changes or something is different about what the results that you receive based upon a given string in the search engine. If it's not what you expect, you're probably not going to trust it as much as if it was something that you were expecting. So it's just making sure that the outputs of these things, if they are generative, are actually what is being expected by the end user because that starts to build that trust element. And there is the bigger question is what is right to do as a publisher, ethically, morally, and commercially. There's lots of different ways in which you have to think about or potentially could have to think about telling an author that their, their content may be used in a large language model to then train for other things. Um, similarly, if you're a large publisher or a publisher who has paywall content or subscription content, what do you do? Do you give that to a model to then be able to train on a data set? It will make the model more accurate, but does that lose you some competitive advantage? If you have only content which is open access, which is being found by these models and being trolled, then does that, that, that's a subset of all of the content that is there. So how does that affect the actual model that is then being trained? There are some examples that in kind of not necessarily academic publishing, but this was BuzzFeed. Um, that started using fully AI-generated articles completely produced by non-editorial staff. And if you notice, I don't know if you can see it particularly well, everywhere is a hidden gem. It became quite boring. Uh, I don't know if anybody's played around with ChatGPT, but if you put in prompts around a certain theme with certain, you know, the specifics of the company name, for example, or an animal if you're talking about that, if you give it long enough, it'll start regurgitating very, very similar pieces of content based upon and the input that is given. But this is an example that was out there in the wild for a little while. Um, I don't believe this is still being used. Also got copyright and data risks. I mentioned this <clears throat> a little bit before. So if you take a normal example of taking input data, putting it into an AI service, getting output data, and making it available to the public, what are the things that could go wrong here? So you potentially got data appropriation. If the AI service that is being used is not validated or trustworthy, um, then some of that data might be used and used against you or used for different reasons to which it was first intended. Copyright infringement, I mentioned, depending on the outputs, there could be copyrighted content in there. And I know there are examples now, ChatGPT has got, you know, I think we are just talking on one of the tables before about um, if you ask ChatGPT, I think, for the main characters out of the Harry Potter novels, it will not tell you the correct answer because that content is copyrighted. 
even despite the fact that you've got lots of different literature around the world which was social media or written in other ways which is not copyrighted, it won't necessarily pick that up. Um, but there is that risk there. And then I was kind of going back to the example I gave of the lawyer who was very expensive mistake to use ChatGPT for his precedence. Um, inaccuracies can come in, falsehoods can be made by, by generative AI. There are always ways that we can look to address this, but also you've got the risk of unchecked bias. There was a study done in the sources at the bottom there um, where outputs from ChatGPT, the most frequent behavior of users or participants in the study, they literally would copy and paste the content that came out of ChatGPT, didn't edit it at all, and therefore running the risk of some of the biases that we've talked about. Um, and it was actually deemed high quality enough that its editorial service was good enough that it didn't need to be looked at. All of these things can just make things a little bit more problematic when implementing those kind of tools. But it's not all Skynet and robots breaking children's fingers. Um, there is a way that I believe humans can help. And I'm going to preface this by saying, as you've seen from my job title, I am a product manager. So therefore, a lot of what I'm going to say now is very much around how product managers particularly, but also in other spaces, um, can help with implementation of AI. So I'll go back to the example of the copyright and data risks. The data, the input data. Have a human operator who's making sure that the data that is going in is correct, and when, when outputs come out that are edited and changed, that then gets fed back into that input data to give it the best chance of being accurate when used again. And also, um, you've got the data appropriation element. So this is, a, you know, it's, it's difficult necessarily to know that everything is not going to use for the purposes without going through all of the legalese um, when the um, service is used. But there is a mitigation about using reputable and validated sources at all times. Also on the copyright infringement piece, this is where again I mentioned about human intervention being important. Because if you are going to have a piece of content which is going to source or cite um, copyrighted data and could lead to issues down, down the road, don't copy and paste, make sure it's checked, make sure it's used as a basis and rewrite that content to then give the new piece of um, information. And then again, just make sure that facts are checked when things come out. So if that lawyer had done that, then he probably wouldn't have had such a big bill at the end of his court case. Just a bit further about how humans can help. So we've talked about this, and you know, if you, if you, I understand that if you always look at a problem or an opportunity as something to address, then you might lose that space of innovation and trying something new and doing something that nobody else has thought of. Absolutely, um, you know, AI, as we heard, I think, you know, certain publishers, certain certain companies are using it in production now. More have ideas about how to use it in the future, but making sure that we start with a problem or an opportunity and try and, and look to address that, um, then that gives you a good chance of giving, getting an output which is something that you desire. We've heard this, you know, resist it as much as you can. Again, a call to use AI is an academic essay. Just because we can, let's try it. This is not to say do it all the time, obviously, absolutely, but you know, putting some kind of structure in place to try and um, make sure that we're spending our money and time in the right place and in the right way. Setting metrics. This is one thing that is very close to my heart as a product manager, but you're implementing a tool or a solution, you want it to deliver an output. Be that revenue, be that time saving, be that productivity. Set those goals. Make sure that you've got it all agreed up front to make sure that what you're gonna get, and it gives you an objective way to try and validate whether what you put in is what you're getting out. And don't be scared to set a kind of a withdrawal criteria or a kill criteria. If that tool does not meet the expectations, don't necessarily continue investing in it, but do have a plan to withdraw it and replace it with a different solution. Have AI as one of a suite of solution options. Difficult to do when, you know, sometimes it's, it's quite a shiny thing and quite exciting, the potential that it could bring, but it's one of other, there are probably gonna be other ways that you could address the same problem. Bring it into that suite of options and make sure it is the best before it is actually implemented. Again, you know, as we do with any product, take customer feedback, take user feedback, take real world feedback, test it, validate your assumptions, and make sure you can adapt the outputs that you're getting based upon the information that goes in. This kind of goes back to the having it as part of a suite of solutions. Implement it where AI is the right one, where it's the right solution, and it's gonna give you the, the best outcome for what you're looking for. 
formalize that monitoring, adaptation, and withdrawal plan, set those kill criteria, ensure proper guardrails are in place for areas where usage of AI can be expected. Now, that could be internally or it could be outside with authors or reviewers. So make sure that policies are updated, author and reviewer guidelines are clear, codes of conduct guidance is updated. And we've done some work at Springer Nature to make sure that these things are at Springer Nature. Taylor and Francis, apologies, going back to my old life. Um, that, that these things have been updated to reflect the potential use of AI in these various different spaces. And the final slide is really just a bit of a workflow and it's very much again, like I said, a product management thing. But it's just that kind of start with a problem or opportunity. Validate that the problem actually exists. Identify those requirements and metrics. Set withdrawal criteria. Identify the solutions that could give you those outputs. Test them. Implement the best solution. Monitor. Adapt and withdraw if necessary. In short, apply product management practice to AI adoption. Thank you. Any questions? So when you think about product management practice, there's a whole suite of tools um, that we can apply yep. in product ideation, product development, product discovery. Yeah. And the way I like to think about it is they go from very, very high, uh, uh, like 5,000 foot view landscape analysis all the way through down to extremely granular things like A-B testing. Right? Today, given where we are with this technology, where is your intuition for what scale we should be asking these questions at? if that makes sense. Yeah, Is I mean, it, because you could say apply product management practice, yeah. but that's not just one thing. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I think the big thing for me at the moment is AI is still generally fairly new, and I think there is a, there's, there's a big hype around ChatGPT, and there's like, this could do everything, this could be great. On the flip side of that, there's like, oh my God, this is gonna end everything, and it's terrifying. The, the reality is somewhere in the middle, and I think the trust element is where we can really help you know, particularly for end users. So it'd be, at my idea right now would be very much, from a pragmatic perspective, that A-B testing. You know, for a, for a, are we spending our money in the right place as a publisher to, to implement this stuff? Test something with a group of users that is giving an AI output, and then do something which is not AI. See which one gives you the best thing. And I think that, along with having those clearly defined metrics and not being scared to say when something isn't working, we don't want to continue with it. Those are the two things that I think would give us our biggest bang for our buck right now. Uh, and as things evolve, obviously, the trust thing might not be so much of a problem, and we can start moving on to those other areas where we can have strategic kind of thinking and that kind of higher level thought. That's my hunch now at the minute, anyway. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And now, um, yeah. That's, I didn't keep you too long, so therefore now you can get to the drinks and networking, which I'm sure everyone's keen on. Yeah,